What is the Boston Red Sox ceiling in 2024? Find out on today's Locked on Red Sox. You are Locked on Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Gabby Hurlbut, former ESPN social media associate and current host of the Boston Balling Podcast, which, by the way, I did drop a new episode of Boston Balling today for the first time in a while. I actually had taken a little bit of a break from the show, but I'm back now. If you want to ever hear me, Talking about other Boston sports, check out that show wherever you listen to podcasts. But I am here on Locked on Red Sox to give you the latest in all things Boston Red Sox straight to your favorite podcast platform for free. And honestly, who wouldn't love free? It's the best thing in the world. So check it out. Start your day off right. Locked on is your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. It's honestly great that we are getting closer and closer to baseball season starting. I know I've missed it a lot, and honestly, regardless of this off season that the Red Sox have had, I'm still excited to have baseball back for my viewing pleasure and be back watching this team regardless of what that team turns out to be and what they look like. And there's a lot of question marks heading into 2024. So on today's show, I'm going to be going over just what exactly the Red Sox floor and ceiling look like with the roster as it stands, what needs to happen in order for them to reach the ceiling, and also what could be a game-changing move or two that this team could make in order to make them a more successful team in the upcoming season. So it is winter weekend. We have approached that time. It's taking place tonight and tomorrow in Springfield. For those of you who are going Definitely enjoy the experience because it's definitely cool to be able to see a lot of the alumni there and people who are just absolute legends in Red Sox Nation. And it's not every day you get to see that many former Red Sox legends in one area. So make sure that you take it all in, digest everything, maybe ask a couple of questions about the direction of this team, where they're going. It's definitely a bummer that they removed the town hall event from the whole experience, but Jonathan Papelbon and Tom Karen are going to be hosting a little late night talk show style thing during the Friday night portion of the event. So be sure to attend that if you are going to winter weekend. And speaking of that, what exactly is the Red Sox floor for the 2024 season. Now, when I think about floor, I like to set the bar pretty low. And considering the moves that the Red Sox have made this offseason and what's kind of been done, their floor is not very high. I'm saying their floor is about 70 wins. I think that is if everything goes wrong, there's a bunch of injuries all season, nobody's performing up to expectations, and they are at the point where people are degressing from 2023 because there's no guarantee that everybody's going to improve. Some players may regress a little bit. And if that's the case, if there are players who do regress as opposed to improving, that could change the overall landscape of how this team does. Nobody expected Jaron Duran to be as good as he was in 2023. And on the same token, there might be a player who you might not expect that could struggle. I mean, Kike Hernandez is an example. He had a great 2021 season with the Red Sox and then fell off a little bit in 2022. And then 2023 for him was just an absolute disaster. He just could not figure it out defensively. And at the plate, he wasn't getting the job done either. And then, of course, he gets traded to the Dodgers close to the trade deadline and just goes back to – thriving there, being a good hitter, actively contributing to their lineup. And it goes to show that 
the environment is a big thing for a player. Where they're playing could impact a lot how they perform moving forward. So the Red Sox, if nothing goes right for them, I think their floor is 70 wins. And that's, you know, not good. And it'll be a very long season and drawn out season if that ends up being the case and we see a 70 win Red Sox team I do not think that it's going to be 70 I think it will be higher than that and when you take everything into consideration the question then becomes what exactly is this team's ceiling what do they have the potential to do considering everything and if everything goes right their ceiling to me is actually around 88 wins. I think, you know, 90 wins would be stretching it because they still don't have a convincing enough starting rotation for me to say they can win 90 games with it. But I do think they could win somewhere in the high 80s, around 88 wins, if they have everything go right, players stay healthy, and they are able to put everything together. And last year, a big problem for Boston was injuries, for one, that kept players sidelined for a while. And number two, to go along with that, is that they couldn't put everything together at the same time. When the pitching was figuring it out, the offense went cold. Then the offense would get hot again, and the pitching would slump back into just this aura of not pitching well and giving up a lot of runs and making it hard for the offense to really do their job effectively. And that was a big problem for me was I could pinpoint throughout the season certain aspects of their game overall as a whole that were strong, but then there were other aspects of their game at the same time that were just so far removed from where they were supposed to be that it completely overrode the positive stuff. And I fear a little bit that we could get a similar situation in 2024 because in some ways I feel like we're entering the season with a team with holes that haven't been filled yet. And I'm not saying they can't be filled before the season starts, but if the roster were to look like this come opening day, it really seems like a roster full of pieces put together that the Red Sox hope will work out in the end for the final product. So I have to keep that ceiling at below 90 wins, but 88 wins is pretty good. 88 wins gives you a chance to fight for a wild card spot. 88 wins gives you a chance to be respectable and competitive in your own division. And the AL East is stacked once again. I expect it to be just as competitive of a division in 2024, there's just very good teams there. And if you can pull off 88 wins in a division like that, then you deserve to be fighting for a playoff spot. And I don't think people should be setting their expectations too high right now and going over that threshold unless the Red Sox do make a couple more impact moves, particularly for a starting pitcher and for a right-handed bat that they can slot into the lineup. But if they do those things, my ceiling may elevate a little bit more and give them a couple more wins on the season. Somebody actually said on Twitter the other day, and it was funny, Kike Hernandez not being on the team gives this team at least two more wins than they had last year. And in a way, that's not wrong because Kike had the worst WAR in baseball last year, which means wins above replacement. So essentially that means that if you took Kike and replaced him with another player, then the Red Sox would be getting less wins with him in that position. If your WAR is negative, that means you're not giving your team any more wins with you in that spot than them sticking a replacement in there would. So you never want to be in the negatives. And unfortunately for Kike, he was. So it's, a joke that that person said that, but it's also funny and true because he was a big defensive liability. So given all of that, I'm saying the ceiling is 88 wins, but what exactly needs to happen in order for them to get to that 88 wins? I'll tell you coming up. 
Do you ever end up in a pinch where you're looking for last minute ticket deals for anything? I know I am. I recently was a few weeks ago looking for UConn basketball tickets and those games are selling out like crazy since they just won the national championship last year. And my friends and I were trying to get tickets and they were sold out on a bunch of sites, but luckily game time came to the rescue and got us great prices and great tickets. It was a great experience and we ended up having good seats for a really good price. Game time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view from your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All in prices show your total upfront so you know you're getting a great deal before you check out. Buy tickets in seconds with two taps. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDON for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. I promise you, if you just take a minute to go through this Game Time site, you won't be disappointed. Another thing that won't disappoint you is the Sirius XM app because you can get the home broadcast of every Red Sox game on there. So you don't have to worry about missing a single pitch. It's such a nice feature to have knowing that if you're working late one day and you can't get home in time for when the game starts, you can at least tune into it by listening and feel like you're still in on the action. So just download the Sirius XM app and search Red Sox and it'll generate that home broadcast of every game for you in 2024. Speaking of 2024, I'm talking about what the Red Sox floor and ceiling is for that season, and I'm putting it in the range of 70 to 88 wins. I'm assuming the Red Sox are going to be somewhere in that range. That's a big range, but it's a big difference in range. 70 wins is like a lot of things went wrong for us this year. We were just not a good baseball team at all, and we could, nothing was going right, and we had a lot of injuries, and just didn't have the right group of players to make this work. 88 wins is like, oh, wow, okay, this team is better than we thought they were going to be. And they came out and proved the fans wrong and proved, you know, the Red Sox front office's view of how this team should be operated. So it really could go a lot of different ways. But what exactly needs to happen in order for them to hit their ceiling and get to a team that may be competing for a wild card spot. And that is the biggest thing. I look at this Red Sox roster right now, and there's a lot of ifs. For example, the pitching rotation right now, Lucas Giolito is a guy who used to be very dominant and then went through some personal things, like went through a divorce and had to go through a transition period of moving on to another team and then getting injured. And so the last couple of years haven't exactly worked out in his favor, both physically and mentally. So he's the type of pitcher who has the potential to bounce back to be what he was prior to all of these outside circumstances going on in his life. And he also has Andrew Bailey working with him and Andrew Bailey being brought on to the Red Sox coaching staff, I believe is a little underrated of a move that they made this off season He's a guy who was super well-desired this offseason. He worked with a few pitchers in San Francisco who have gone on to be star caliber pitchers. And it goes to show his track record. He has a successful track record of making pitchers better. And that's what you want in pitchers in your starting rotation. And if he works with Lucas Giolito, there's a chance Giolito could bounce back to be a very reliable number two, maybe number three starter in this rotation. And yes, the Red Sox need a number one. I don't think they quite have that yet. Brian Bayo to me is more of a two or three right now that could work his way up to being a number one, but isn't necessarily there yet. And then Lucas Giolito, like I mentioned, could be right up there with him. But the key word there is could be. There's a question mark with him because you don't know if he's ever going to get back to what he was before. 
So in order for the Red Sox to reach their ceiling in 2024, he needs to get back to some form of what he was pre the last couple of years when all of these other things started happening. So thinking about all of that and taking that into consideration, that's just one thing that needs to go right for the Red Sox in 2024 in order for them to make this work and be a team that's fighting for a playoff spot. Then you look at the rest of the starters. I already talked about Brian Bayo, who is definitely developing and moving in the right direction, but the Red Sox are assuming that he's going to continue to move in that right direction. And I truly do think he will. He hasn't really shown signs of digression at all. And I'm excited to have Andrew Bailey work with him and hone in on his skills and really figure out what is going to make him the best pitcher that he can be. Um, So that is another factor in that I'm pretty excited to see what he can do in 2024. But what if he digresses a little bit, then that's another problem for the starting rotation. The Red Sox seem to be really thinking that he's going to keep developing the same way that he is. And I could say the same thing about Cutter Crawford. Cutter Crawford is another guy who definitely showed a lot of improvement in 2023, but I'm still not fully convinced on how effective of a pitcher and consistent of a pitcher he's going to be able to be. And he definitely is the type of guy who can continue to develop as well, but I'm not as confident in him as I am in Brian Bayo. And what happens if he had a good year in 2023, but then can't figure it out in 2024? Then you go to Nick Pavetta, who to me is probably the biggest question mark in this rotation because of the fact that he, to me, was much better out of the bullpen. He didn't start pitching really well last year until the Red Sox stopped putting him in their starting rotation and had him pitch out of the bullpen instead. And bullpen Nick Pavetta was lights out. And that was a type of fire that I wanted to see from him. And he looked so confident. And then they put him back in the rotation towards the end of the season to let him try himself out in the rotation again. And he pitched fine, but it was short term. So what happens if we go into the 2024 season and he is not pitching well out of the rotation again, then you're looking at a situation where it's like, well, this is a pitcher that we relied on pretty heavily to be in our rotation. So now what do we do? Then you're looking at this question mark fifth spot in the rotation between Josh Winkowski, Tanner Houck, and Garrett Whitlock, all three of which have experience in the bullpen. And Winkowski only has experience in the bullpen, but he had some great performances out of the bullpen last year. So I understand the Red Sox maybe wanted to give him a chance to be a starter, but that alone in itself is a question mark because how can Whitlock to me have their best stuff out of the pen? And the more the Red Sox try to tell themselves that people can be starters, the less I'm sold on that idea actually working. So that's the rotation. And in order for them to hit their ceiling with that, everything needs to go right. Bayo and Crawford need to continue to show leaps like they did in 2023. Lucas Giolito needs to find some semblance of what he was back to a few seasons ago. And Nick Pavetta needs to still be what bullpen Nick Pavetta was bringing. Then you look at, you know, the progress of the young guys who are on the other side of the ball. So uh, Tristan Casas, Jaron Duran, um, Will Yarabrayu, guys like that. Sadam Raphael, I can even throw into this category. Guys who are young and haven't had a ton of major league experience yet, who the Red Sox are really looking to develop more in 2024. Even Masataka Yoshida, I think they're expecting that he's going to have a better season in 2024, which sure, I'll give them that. He might because he had to get acclimated in 2023. And now that he has a full season under his belt, he probably can start to maybe improve his offensive numbers at the plate. Think about the pitches that he was struggling to make contact with and start to improve the way that he approaches the plate. So sure, I'll give them that. But then you're looking at, you know, Will you're a Abreu, that was such a small sample size with him. I definitely really liked what I saw there. 
But I can't sit here and say I'm overly confident that he's definitely going to continue to move in the direction he needs to go in. And with the strategy the Red Sox seem to be going by right now is that they have more faith in these guys to improve to the point where they feel like they don't need to make a lot of moves around them. And with Casas, I mean, seeing that he just had a really strong rookie season, I'm sure he will to continue to move in the direction he needs to move in. But what happens if Jaron Duran's 2023 season was one that was just, you know, I don't want to say fluke because that's not exactly the best way to say it in baseball terms. But what if it just happened to be a season where he absolutely dominated and he was on top of the world feeling confident and then he snaps back to reality in 2024 and he isn't as strong as he was. Then you're looking at your starting center fielder and saying, well, you know, we might need to find this production elsewhere. And Tyler O'Neill, he's another one that I can throw into this category of can he stay healthy? If he stays on the field, that's going to be a great bat for Fenway. He definitely has the swing for Fenway Park. And defensively, I mean, he's won the gold glove a couple times. So I'm not really worried about his defense. But he needs to stay healthy in order for the Red Sox to be as competitive as we're hoping they can be in 2024. So in order for them to reach their ceiling, again, all of those guys that I listed that are position players need – to continue to grow and develop in the way the Red Sox are thinking they will. And there's risks involved with this because if this doesn't all happen, the Red Sox will not be that competitive of a team in 2024. And it almost seems to me like the Red Sox front office and ownership are okay with taking that risk. And if there are certain players who don't live up to expectations, then down the road they evaluate if they see them as part of the future or not. But it's definitely, you know, a gamble to take. And another player who can really make or break how the season goes for Boston is Trevor Story. I mean, when the Red Sox signed him, he came with a really strong track record, especially defensively. And I'm, again, not worried about his defense. He made the Red Sox a better defensive team when he came back last year after his surgery. And the Red Sox just looked like, a much more cohesive unit in the infield with him there. So Trevor Story, if he's healthy still, his arm was insurmountably better this past season. And when he came back and he, his arm just looked as good as new. So if he can improve at the plate and kind of get to the offensive numbers he wants to get to, that'll be huge for this Red Sox team. That's a little bit of an underrated thing that people aren't really talking about as much is I think the Red Sox believe he can have a bounce back year and we need him to if we want this team to reach their ceiling. So they have the capability to be a very competitive team, but the problem is that there are so many question marks and so many things that potentially could go wrong with it that sometimes you do need some of the sure thing in order to feel confident. So there are a lot of factors in this. But coming up, I'm going to be discussing a couple of game-changing moves that could make the Red Sox a more defined competitive team. Are you a fan of sports betting? Is it something that you've always been interested in? If so, FanDuel is the place for you. The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same-game parlays, find bets in the new Explore tab, make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. FanDuel is something that my fiance has recently gotten very addicted to, and he loves making bets on it. He finds it so fun. So you can be that person too if you head to FanDuel today. 
Also, don't forget to download the SiriusXM app because you can get the home broadcast of every Red Sox game straight to your phone so you don't have to worry about missing a single pitch. It's honestly great, and it makes you feel really reassured that you won't miss anything. So download the SiriusXM app today. And also, while you're at it, Locked On has also launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. This is seriously very exciting for the network because no other network has this and it'll keep you in the loop on everything going on in sports so you don't have to sit through Twitter and try to catch up that way. So subscribe to Locked On Sports today on YouTube. The Boston Red Sox have capability in 2024 to surprise us and be a better team than we're thinking, but a lot of things have to go right in order for that to happen. And they could change that narrative by making a couple of game-changing moves. One game-changing move to me would be if they acquired a right-handed bat that would be able to contribute offensively, such as Jorge Soler, a player who's proven and can play defense in the outfield that can help balance out the lineup. And if they do acquire him, that would allow him to kind of replace Yoshida in the outfield and his production in the outfield because they could then move Yoshida to more of a full-time DH and it would kind of solve a lot of the defensive liability problems that he has and take less, you know, pressure on him to be able to perform that way. So Jorge Soler to me would be a game-changing move for Boston. This is a guy that I would look at and say, okay, yeah, this guy is going to help turn this Red Sox team around and make the lineup a lot more competitive and more balanced out. And it creates a much better outlook in the outfield with, you know, the starting outfield being Duran, O'Neal, and Soler, and then Yoshida being a DH. And then obviously, you know, they figure out what to do with the Brayu at that point. But defensively, that's a very strong starting outfield. And those are guys that I defensively would trust. And so Lair at the plate has very good numbers too. So he's another guy that I think could just help elevate this team and make them one step closer to being a more competitive team that they need to be. A second game-changing move that the Red Sox could make that would make me sit here and change my overall philosophy about this team is trading for a number one starting pitcher. This definitely to me isn't going to happen. I'm picturing a player like Dylan Cease in my head. If the Red Sox were willing to be super aggressive and go out and get a guy like him, that's a game-changing move because that's a no doubt number one starting pitcher that the Red Sox could slot into their rotation and immediately make the rotation much better than they were. And That should be a no-brainer that they need a guy like that. But the question is, you know, do they have the means right now to trade for a guy like that? And the answer is no. Essentially, I mean, you don't want to be forced to give up players like Roman Anthony, Marcelo Meyer, or Kyle Teal because those guys are going to be the cornerstones for your team moving forward. And likely at least one of those guys would have to be moved in the trade if you were to bring in Cease. So at this point, I don't think the Red Sox have the means to do that, but that would be a game-changing move. I'd even add that signing somebody like a Jordan Montgomery or a Blake Snell would be a game-changing move because those two guys are more proven and effective and don't have as many question marks surrounding them as guys like Nick Pavetta or Cutter Crawford do right now, or even Lucas Giolito. Those are guys who have this proven track record of success, especially Montgomery as of late with that incredible playoff run and his performance in the postseason with the Rangers. Those are game-changing moves. The Red Sox, to me, haven't made a game-changing move yet. Tyler O'Neill could be a game-changing move, but again, it depends on his health. 
another external question mark factor. So when I'm looking at this Red Sox roster right now, my issue isn't about the ceiling because they definitely have a higher ceiling than I think people make it out to be. But my issue is just all the circumstances surrounding that and the fact that the moves they have made are not game changing. And when I think full throttle, I think game changing moves. I don't think the Red Sox will make these game-changing moves, but those to me are the aggressive type of game-changing moves that I could sit here and say the Red Sox just became a lot better team because of that. And do I think they're a better team than they were in 2023? If all goes right, yes, I do think they are, but that's not saying a whole lot because they weren't a very good team last year. So again, game-changing moves are there any that they could do before spring training starts? Yes. Will they? Most likely not. Seeing, you know, and hearing about the attitudes of this Red Sox front office, I don't think that's the position that they're looking to take and the direction that they want to go in with this team right now. But those would be moves that could clearly define this team and fill holes that are very glaring still. But Whatever happens over the next few weeks is going to set the tone for how the season is going to go in Boston. And it could be really good if all goes right, or it could be not so good if a lot of things go wrong. But don't forget to download the Sirius XM app and search Red Sox so you can get the home broadcast of every Red Sox game straight to your phone all season long. I highly recommend it. Also, subscribe to Locked On Sports today on YouTube so you can catch all the action on the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel so that you can feel caught up in all things sports and not have to worry about catching up through Twitter. So absolutely subscribe to Locked On Sports today as well. As always, keep the faith. Go Red Sox. And I will catch you on the flip side.